Okay. So we're live this afternoon with Undersecretary of State Keith Kroc. I'm so happy to be here with you. It's supposed to be a fireside chat. I feel like we need one of those Christmas Yule logs underneath or on the screen to, to evoke that. But nonetheless, um, we'll, um, we'll do the best we can. And thank you to all of our viewers. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about Undersecretary um, Keith Kroc and his title, which actually I just learned uh, is for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, which I think is a relatively new title. I like it a lot. He's been at the State Department since June 2019. Prior to that, uh, he's had a really illustrious and interesting career. Um, he's been a businessman and entrepreneur. He's noted for bringing transformational leadership to a variety of sectors, including factory automation, engineering, and even education. Some of you might not realize that he's also was the CEO and really the founder of DocuSign, which also is quite incredible today because we're all using DocuSign much more than we ever were, right? Uh, certainly. Um, DocuSign has reduced the ecological impact of paper, which I think is really interesting and has really transformed the industry. Um, Keith has also been, as I mentioned, very active in education. He's chairman of the board of trustees of Purdue University, which has been one of the universities that is creating and initiating a new model for STEM education. It drove progress in student affordability. I think uh, Keith had told me that actually Purdue had had not risen, uh, had, had controlled its tuition costs among, it was the leading university to do that around the country. And I also learned that we have a connection with Hudson in terms of uh, Mitch Daniels, a former governor who's president of Purdue and who Keith helped um, to nominate and to, to, to become president. Mitch was also the chairman and CEO of the Hudson Institute. So there are all of these connections. I think overall, if I could identify one word to describe Keith, his personality and his contributions, it's transformational. And anyone who's worked in government before knows how difficult it is <laughs> to transform government, to get it to be more efficient, more responsive. Um, and so I'm interested today in talking to Keith, learning about what he's doing, what his priorities are, and of course, uh, understanding how the State Department and his team are helping to respond um, in the current COVID-19 crisis. So thank you so much, Keith, for being here. Well, Nadia, thanks so much uh, for having me, and I really appreciate uh, this fireside chat. And uh, thanks so much for that kind of introduction. Um, you know, I, I, I've been blessed. I've had the good fortune to create and uh, and lead some uh, great companies that has had, uh, you know, an impact in terms of uh, productivity, you know, which which has really driven, uh, uh, you know, GDP per capita, right? Standard of living, right. accelerate commerce, human capital. And, you know, you look at DocuSign, uh, it has had a tremendous uh, impact on the health of the planet uh, as well. And I never thought I'd end up uh, running economic diplomacy here at the State Department. Um, and what led you here? What led you here? That like, how, how did you end up here? Uh, what have your experiences been over the past year? Uh, what have been some of your major aha moments? Uh, talk yeah, a little so bit about um, uh, you know how I got here was uh, this is when I was leading DocuSign, and we had been in every major country uh, except for uh, China. So now it was time to go on the two-week listening trip to China. So I went over there uh, for two weeks and. Uh, I had a meeting with five of the top seven Politburo members, uh, you know, a whole bunch of uh, CEOs. I had, my first time there was 1981, but um, I had an inside look at the technology and uh, and all of that typical things that when you go over there and it, it kind of really turned my head and I was back in Silicon Valley for about a week. And I said, you know, I wonder if the folks in Washington know this. And I really didn't know uh, hardly anybody uh, in Washington, but um, a few people. And when I went over and met with uh, uh, someone in the White House, let's say, um, and and they said, Croc, well, have you ever thought about serving your country? And I go, well, that's a dream I never knew I had. Um, and I go, I'd be honored to. And they go, can you move? I go, I can move anywhere in the world. Next thing you know, I'm with Secretary uh, uh, Pompeo. And um, I can tell you, it is uh, the privilege of my life to be able to give back to this great country that has given so much to my family uh, and me. 
And, 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 you know, I'll tell you what it's like. It's interesting. I've had a bunch of ahas. The first one is the people. And, you know, everybody in Silicon Valley asked me, they go, so what's it like working over there at the State Department? And I go, yeah, I got to tell you, these foreign service officers and civil servants are some of the smartest people I know. They can speak four to seven languages. They're mission driven. They work their tails off. They make you guys look lazy. Uh, I, I, you know, and, and I go, um, just like when you see a military officer, um, you thank them for their service. I said, when you see uh, career foreign service officers or civil servants, thank them for their service because regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of politics in Washington, they are professionals. Uh, they, are, they are great leaders and they are great diplomats. So, you know, that's kind of my, I mean, it's my first thought. The other thing is, and maybe I should have known this, but, um, you know, what the federal government is all about, the true north is national security. And I'm really understanding uh, what that is all about, particularly during this crisis. And my respect and admiration uh, uh, for the state government, for the federal government, during this crisis is, is, is unreal. I tell my wife back in San Francisco that all the time. Um, and I guess the third aha was, uh, you know, I, I had experienced a lot of things uh, with regard to the uh, Chinese Communist Party and, and some of the things they've done. I mean, I grew up in, uh, uh, in Ohio. I'm an old manufacturing guy from General Motors. So I see how it's devastated our heartland and the soul of our economic engine in terms of small and medium-sized manufacturing. Uh, I've had my intellectual property ripped off. Um, uh, I know what it's like going over there and, and, and doing business. And now that I'm here, I truly understand that uh, the threat of the Communist Party is, is real and urgent. And, uh, and, I, and, and you know, I hosted Secretary Pompeo out in Silicon Valley for, for four days at the beginning of the year. And the message, the message I gave, uh, you know, my my fellow CEOs out there, who, you know, are all good friends, is, is um, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, guys, how we say out here, corporate responsibility is national security. It is also, uh, you know, I might say also so uh, social responsibility, corporate response, but it's national security, and I think everybody's. I think everybody's getting that now, Nadia. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, it's interesting, an audience question came in, which I'll, say, I'll save for later, later, but it does go to some of how tech companies can play a role in the current crisis. But speaking of that, can you tell us a little bit about how the State Department is mobilizing uh, to deal with the current crisis? Um, what's changed? What, what are, what's the next month or two looking like from your perspective? Yeah. That would no. be great. You got it, you got it. Um, you know, the way, um, the way uh, we're looking at it right now and, and, and the things that we're doing is number one, um, you know, it is keep America safe. So if you look at uh, what we've been doing, we've had 45, we have 45,000 citizens, American citizens overseas. Um, and we have brought uh, roughly about uh, uh, 24,000 of those back. Um, we repatriate, uh, repatriate them. We've had 446 flights from uh, 73 countries. And by the way, 190 of those flights are commercial airlines. So that's one of the things in my remit. I mean, when I talk to these CEOs of, of these airline companies, it's like, hey, look, this is our duty. I mean, it is really inspiring. Um, and, and one of the other things um, uh, that we're really focused on is bringing uh, – you know, the PPE and the medicines over from overseas and working with companies like FedEx and UPS and uh, Delta, we're bringing literally plane loads over. So we're working directly uh, with FEMA. Um, our embassies have been great uh, in terms of looking all over the place um, for, uh, for these vital supplies so we can feed them. And, and that's, a, you know, that's a really a vital link. Um, the, you know, the other, the other thing in the key area is one of the things also under my remit is infectious diseases. So we're promoting international cooperation when it comes to science and technology and, uh, and finding that 
uh, vaccine as, as fast as we totally can. And we're also, as I understand it, providing, um, I guess Secretary Pompeo had announced a tranche of about $270 million in aid, I think, right, to allies and partners, um, uh, and partly to help them com combat uh, the disease and what's the virus and what's happening. Absolutely. That's a, that's a big, that's a big part of it. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we're doing is we're really bringing in the private sector. When I mean private sector, I mean the, um, uh, the business sector, the educational sector, as well as the social sector. Um, and there's so much tremendous leverage there. And the response um, from the CEOs has been uh, absolutely uh, incredible. We see it everywhere, whether it's Microsoft, Cardinal Health, Kaiser Permanente, Medtronic, um, all these companies have been incredibly responsive and generous. Well, since, since one of the audience questions actually just has to do with that, I'll ask it if there's any follow-up. The question is what room is there for tech companies to cooperate with the United States government on international responses? And it sounds like a lot of that is happening, but that you're open to uh, hearing ideas from the private sector. Did you want to comment a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. It, I mean, they've, uh, they've responded in great ways. I mean, Microsoft has, uh, Google has, um, Cisco has because uh, so so much of this is all about um, uh, speed to result mm -hmm. and 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 they've been absolutely incredible in terms of speeding up the different things uh, that need to be done and improving productivity and reducing the paperwork and all of that and then I've, I've also spent a lot of time with uh, the CEOs of the pharmaceutical companies um, and working with, with, with those folks uh, in terms of, you know, how can we help you out uh, in terms of distribution, in terms of um, accelerating your, your drug trials and all, all kinds of things like that, as well as major supply chain issues in terms of raw materials for APIs. So um, that's great. It, yeah, so it's been absolutely great. Now, I wanted to switch a little bit to sort of the medium term, right? In the midst of a crisis, it's all hands on deck. We have to respond immediately, but it's also important in the role of the government not to lose sight of some longer term um, problem sets and challenges and opportunities that it needs to, it needs to also uh, look at and not lose sight of. And I know that you've been working really hard on an economic security strategy I know it's a forward-looking document. Of course, it has to be uh, address some of the immediate needs that we just talked about. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about that document, a little bit about um, what we've talked about in the past, about uh, some of your concepts for international partnerships in that document. Um, and I think the audience might be interested in that. Sure. So, um, uh, and, and, and by the way, what we did is, is uh, obviously the, the, uh, the pandemic affects everything. And so we've really uh, pivoted on focusing on that on the short, short term, but in the intermediate term and long term, uh, those, those plans remain uh, intact. And, you know, on the pandemic, what we see is, it, it, you know, it's not binary, it's going to be a rolling transition. Um, and so if you look at if you look at that plan, uh, the economic security strategy plan, uh, is that it's broken into four pillars. Um, and that first pillar is, is keep America uh, running and, and a number of things that we're working on in, in that area in terms of, uh, in, you know, keeping America investing, keeping America innovating, innovating, keeping America learning, um, all of those kind of uh, uh, different things. And then as we begin to crank it up, um, and we were in fantastic economic uh, shape before the pandemic hit. And that's provided us a great basis, but uh, we have an opportunity to reignite it and to turbocharge our economic competitiveness. And, uh, and some of the things, uh, for example, in that strategy is uh, continue to invest in the American uh, worker, you know, in terms of uh, STEM and retraining and economic empowerment of women um, and, and then also uh, increasing access to capital and some innovative ideas in terms of 
um, a, uh, uh, an, an innovation research uh, fund that we actually uh, take public sector money and get it matched by the, by the private sector. And also a number of initiatives in terms of expanding on the success of opportunity zones and creating virtual um, technology zones, uh, manufacturing uh, zones, um, and, and, those, and those kind of things. Another big one, of course, is accelerating uh, the digital tran transformation because that drives productivity so much, and it's, and you know, in the in the tech world, it's all about, you know, the ultimate currency is speed. So it speeds it up, but it also does for our basic industries, um, uh, as well. And and then you know <laughs> some of the other things uh, that we're looking at as well is rebuilding, um, rebuilding our own infrastructure. Um, we're we're looking at. Uh, uh, extending our lead in R&D, rebuilding uh, our, our industrial base, as well as a realignment uh, on supply chains. So uh, it, I think that's key. A key focus is innovation on 10 critical sectors. And some of the things that are, you know, in those critical sectors are AI, uh, autonomous vehicles, um, 6G, uh, quantum computing, uh, biotechnology, um, smart cities. So that, that, that's a big aspect of that. Then, then there's another pillar on but safeguarding. Before, um, yeah. I just wanted to, I made a mistake. So before you get into pillar two, I needed to remind yeah. the audience that if they do have questions, uh, they should email events at hudson.org, or you can tweet at Hudson Institute. Um, and uh, that's a way to ask questions. So while, while you're explaining pillar two, sorry for the interruption. All right, you got it. And then, um, uh, the other aspect of, of that, in addition to turbocharging our economic competitiveness, is safeguarding America's assets. And assets like technology, like intellectual property, um, like our financial systems, um, like our American institutions, uh, like education, media, um, all, you know, all of that, as well as our open markets and um, our supply chain. So there's a big focus on that. And, you know, in this great power competition, uh, we've experienced a lot of that. And, uh, you know, wh where we stand is, is it's pretty simple. And that is, you know, with a, a, a standard set of trust principles, which is accountability and integrity and transparency and reciprocity and also respect for rule of law and respect for property uh, of all kinds. So that's a key aspect of that. And there's a lot of things that uh, we're, we're doing and we need to do. And you had some our, interesting ideas with them to work on those principles uh, with partners and allies and to create kind of a, a, a trusted network of, of partners and allies that share those ideas. Yeah, and, 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 and that is uh, the last pillar and that is um, to form a network of trusted partners. And we call that the Economic Prosperity Network. And that is comprised of uh, uh, like-minded countries, uh, companies, and civil society that operate by those set of uh, trust principles, trust standards. And in all areas of economic uh, collaboration, so in areas, uh, not just digital, but also infrastructure, energy, uh, trade, um, uh, money flows, uh, research, um, education. Um, so really across uh, um, all, those, all those lines. And, and you know, uh, since I've been in this role, I've had a chance to have about 60 bilaterals with either you know foreign ministers or finance ministers or economic uh, ministers, and that really resonates. And, and what we're really finding out is that you know the world wants and needs America uh, to lead. And I think the time is right. And I and I think um, during this pand you know pandemic uh, is really a great opportunity for the United States to step step up. It's not a time uh, to take our, our foot off the gas on that one. All right, thank you.
What are we, um, one of the audience questions has to do specifically with the Indo-Pacific, which I know has been a big feature of, um, of this administration of emphasizing the importance of the region um, in terms of infrastructure, energy, are, are there some recent initiatives that you might want to tell us about in that domain? Sure. And, um, and that's ones that, uh, you know, we, we're either intimately involved with or uh, we, we've initiated them. You know, along the infrastructure lines, uh, what we've uh, uh, facilitated is the creation of, of what we affectionately call the Blue Dot Network. And it's along those lines where it's like-minded uh, countries and like-minded, uh, so I would say like-minded uh, uh, countries that have the resources, the financial capital, the human capital, the businesses to build infrastructure in developing uh, countries. And, you know, such an important part of that is to make sure we have high quality, high integrity, uh, trusted uh, standards that we operate by. And we've had, uh, we initially last October, uh, we signed an agreement between US, Japan and Australia. And now uh, we've had a lot of meetings with the Europeans. They're excited about it. And that's, you know, that's a great example of one from an infrastructure perspective. We're also doing, uh, uh, same thing along the lines of energy as well. Um, uh, back in October also at uh, the Indo-Pacific Forum, uh, we signed with Japan a $10 billion agreement on uh, building out energy uh, infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region. And now a lot of the other folks are, uh, a lot of the other countries are joining along with us. So, uh, and, and there's no reason not to extend that uh, around the world. And that is why, you know, we have that economic uh, uh, prosperity network. Thanks, Keith. There also, I think um, one of the things um, I've learned over the past few months is how the department is thinking about American businesses and our commercial diplomacy and our um, kind of support for American businesses abroad in a different way, thinking uh, of them as part of the solution to a lot of, um, uh, you know, to, to working and addressing challenges. And I was wondering if you wanted to tell us a little bit about that as well. We have a great yeah. commercial diplomatic service as well, right, which is often not well known, um, thinking about integrating that into the how our embassies work, you know, in, in an even stronger way. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, Nadia, this was one of my ahas coming into government because, um, you know, I've had a chance to take four companies overseas, um, actually entire categories overseas. And what you do is, you know, you you've, you go country by country and you sequence it out and you go on a listing trip and you set up meetings with uh, 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 potential customers, investors, distributors, even your competitors. And man, you hit the jackpot if you could set one up um, with a, a, you know, with a government official, uh, because you know, you're starting out, you get up to about 300 people in size, then you take it overseas. And I'll tell you one thing, and I've written papers on this, on this process. I never thought once about calling up the United States State Department or Commerce Department. And I can tell you, um, That'd be, they would be the first folks I would call because instant credibility, set it up, easy, boom, done. So we're, you're right. It's not well known. We're trying to get the word out a lot better. I see this as a big opportunity. And, we're, and so we look at partnering with the private sector in this area really on two fronts. One on the tactical front in terms of helping United States businesses win deals. And one of the things that we've done is we formed a DC central deal team. We have deal teams in all our embassies where when companies go over, um, you know, you help them find it out, break bottlenecks. The DC central uh, deal teams, what they do is they get these, uh, first of all, it's a direct line into the embassy one. So we're supporting them. Um, but we also uh, bring in all the different financing arms. And by the way, there's 28 financing arms sort of agencies, departments, I found out in the United States government. So it gets confusing for our yeah. diplomats out there in the field, our commercial officers in the field. So we bring them all, uh, all together, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the um, Export Import Bank, the DFC, you name it. 
Um, and then we'll we'll package those solutions up. So ideally, uh, we can prepackage those things. We bring in the private sector folks as well, because a lot of times we get from our uh, economic uh, officers out there in the field is, hey, we got a project. You know, I don't even know how, I don't even know where to look. You know, for a U.S. company on this. So we 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 kind of create that that hub and spoke. So that's kind of from a tactical tactical standpoint. From a more strategic standpoint, what we've done is we've kind of taken that concept and put it a little more on steroids. And we've created a thing called prosperity partnerships. So this is for developing uh, nations where it is uh, a country to country um, uh, uh, partnership. And so we bring out all the tools in our diplomatic uh, toolkit, but we also combine it with um, the financing arms and then also with the private sector and you know the social sector, the, the education sector, as well as the business sector. And the objective is threefold. The first one is, is to improve the business climate um, in these countries because that really creates uh, a halo effect and a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. when we do these partnerships with them. And then the second one is to develop their human capital. And then the third one is, is to improve their security and their justice systems and their regulations, help them out along, uh, help them out along those lines. And, um, uh, you know, we have our ambassadors now going out and doing country business plans uh, uh, for these. And we've created a set of packages. Uh, we have like the innovation package, educational package, the agricultural package. Um, so uh, we're really trying to be much more proactive um, as opposed to, you know, customize those out in the field. And also, you know, one agency does it at a time. So this is, we're spear, uh, spearheading this on a interagency basis. That sounds interesting. I didn't realize that. In a way, you're, you're essentially trying to help create the foundations of successful societies and the building blocks of those societies. And to your point earlier about the tactical, I mean, that's actually quite important, right? Because if you're a businessman or if you're out in the field in any capacity, that tactical is really important. You can talk about the strategic, but you have to have the nuts and bolts to get things done and to understand the complexity of, as you mentioned, the financing system that we have. Um, speaking of financing, as we sort of um, wrap fairly soon, do you want to say a little bit about debt and what's been happening with BRI, uh, Belt Road Initiative, and the problem of debt overall and how we're thinking about that in terms of potential allies and partners and infrastructure? I know yeah, that you've, you know, been giving, you've given that thought. Is there also corporate, you know, you, you understand sort of the world of corporations, corporate debt as well. So how does, how, what have you learned? Yeah. How has that helped you understand uh, your current job? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's been uh, really eye-opening for me because when I have these bilaterals with the nations from Africa or South America or um, Southeast Asia and, uh, you know, they talk about uh, the One Belt, One Road um, uh, initiative. And, 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 you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, some of them call it the One Belt, One Way Toll Road to Beijing um, because they're strapped with uh, all this debt. And what's interesting is those, those uh, Chinese loans, um, even their, so I mean, their sovereign loans, they're the only ones that do with the sovereign loans, they collateralize those, and um, and and with some crazy terms, and they make them sign um, uh, very tight non-disclosure agreements. And the times we find out about them is when there is a, a political change in the country, like what we experienced um, down in Ecuador, because these lo these loans are so stringent that they don't even want to make them available to the public. So I'll give you an example. The country of Ecuador um, owes $13 billion uh, to the Chinese government. Now, uh, maybe that's not a lot in US terms, but it's huge for the country of Ecuador. And those loans are collateralized uh, with this. That is, if they don't pay back these loans, then uh, the government of China has the right to seize any asset in the country 
other than their historical artifacts or their military. They can take any port, any highway, any dam, any office building. Um, I mean, they could, I mean, as far as that reads, I mean, they could take anybody's home. So um, we're trying to understand that. I've had some great conversations with uh, Crystalina from the IMF and with David Malpaz at, at the World Bank is, hey, you know, we need to understand these loans because um, otherwise, when, you know, I told him, I said, when you guys are giving the loans or, uh, or when the United States is giving foreign assistance, we're in essence, you know, paying for these Chinese loans. And in many cases, um, what the Chinese do is they say, well, you know, pay us back in commodities uh, for, the, for the oil producing countries like Ecuador. It's in barrels of oil because China needs hard currency. So, um, we're really trying to understand uh, uh, that, uh, get our arms around that, um, because it's really it's really gotten out of hand. And now with the uh, pandemic, uh, these these countries are going to go. Um, it, you know, it's going to be tough for these guys. And you know, so the IMF and the World Bank just put out a joint statement just a couple weeks ago that they want the creditor nations to. Um, uh, uh, forget basically kind of forgive these uh, loans, um, uh, you know, because of the pandemic uh, crisis. And, and so, um, you know, this issue is really big. And this issue of transparency is big. And, you know, my suggestion, uh, you know, to David was, is, well, let's go to the country of China and let's ask him to, you know, tell us what these terms are, the collateral. He goes, well, we've done that. And, they, what they say is they don't even know what that, uh, those terms of collateral, they said, we have so many provincial banks and private banks and all that, um, uh, that we don't know. So I think really what we want to do is we want to say, well, then waive the non-disclosure cl clause, because I can tell you the borrowing nations, they'll know that. And uh, I think that's, I just think that's good hygiene. It's good transparency, because otherwise, you know, all these other nations, including the United States, are just paying off this really bad Chinese debt. Well, that's interesting because one of the audience questions really you essentially answered it was how can how can the um, US government work to promote free enterprise and transparent business practices globally? And I think you mentioned something very specifically about the transparency of yeah. loans. Um, and that's a you know a specific step toward that broader problem set. Yeah, and and by the way, transparency and reciprocity, right, are just two great and important principles that um, uh, are critical when you're dealing with authoritarian uh, uh, governments or malign regimes. So um, I think that is really important, and it's one of the messages also that we give to the private sector CEOs: is you need to help us out in terms of the transparency. And, uh, you know, I look at part of my role too, Nadia, as being a bridge between uh, Silicon Valley and Washington, because there's, there's not a lot of people out here uh, who've either come from the manufacturing business like I did for 10 years at General Motors or uh, from Silicon Valley. And- um, uh, You're a walking public-private partnership. <laughs> well, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm telling you what, I'm trying to do my best, and I see this is where the greatest opportunity lies. And you know, what's interesting is that what I tell all the people at the State Department, I said, look, I go, oh, you know, and I said, hey, you know, no offense to the government relations folks or anything, but, you know, they're there to ask for things. Uh, talk to the CEOs because they're the easiest to talk to. And you could be really prescriptive with them. And I, and I can tell you that these folks are patriotic. And I tell them, you know, they, they I mean, they wish they kind of were uh, uh, like you guys and, and, and serve the country. Now, their career didn't take them in that path, but they want to be able to give back too. So if you ask them to do something, they're going to do it. Um, and, and by the way, we're seeing that in spades right now during the pandemic. It's it's amazing. So I don't go around saying, hey, I told you so. But it's just, it's really, it's heartwarming uh, to see everybody pull together on that.
So I think we have one more question. I think we covered it, but I'll, I'll go and then I think we'll start to wrap because I know you have a busy day and we are in the middle of a crisis. Um, like you to, as we wrap, think about maybe the the one or two ideas that you hope people will look back on and say, Keith, you know, you were really pivotal uh, for helping change X, Y, and Z. I mean, I think this question really um, we've we've talked about how what are we doing to combat the CCP's version of economic development globally, BRI. Um, how are we working with international businesses to achieve that? So not to answer that for you, but partly what we just talked about, right? The the, the the asking for reciprocity and transparency are key parts of that, right? Yeah, it, so I would say the first one, Nadia, would be that trusted economic prosperity network um, that is comprised of like-minded countries and companies and, and civil society. I mean, if you think about it, in essence, it is a unifying and equitable alternative to the one belt, one road. and. Um, and, and, you know, um, it, if there's anything I know is that there is strength and power and unity and solidarity. And when I, uh, when I look at what the Chinese communist party does, uh, well, to, to quote president Xi, he's, he, he says seduce with money and reinforce with intimidation and retaliation. And I've seen where he's retaliated against CEOs. All you have to do is look at the, the NBA for that, a seven word tweet. And all, you know, within 24 hours, $100 million of sponsorships were dropped. And then they called up Adam Silver and they said, uh, you got to apologize to the Chinese people. Here's the exact words. You got to fire the general manager of the Houston Rockets. That's one we heard about. And I know for everyone we hear about, there's over 100 that we have it. And they do the same things uh, to countries. You see what, you know, what they did to Norway because they put up a Chinese dissident for the Nobel Prize. They retaliated against them for five years. So um, there, there is power and strength and unity and, and solidarity. And, and I think the time is right. I think the president woke up the United States uh, in terms of they've been in economic war with us for 40 years. We just didn't know it. And we've enabled them, as Secretary Pompeo has said, uh, you know, started long, it started long ago because we really believe that, um, you know, it, if, if uh, capitalism equals democracy, well, they've proven that wrong. And now the secretary says, we can't, you know, we got to treat them, we got to take our rose colored glasses off, but we got to treat them uh, not as we hope to be, but how they are and until they change. So. And what I like about the Economic Prosperity Network is that, um, hey, anybody can play. You just have to play by these uh, uh, trust standards and these trust principles. So, so providing uh, alternatives and choices for, for different actors, yeah, allies, yeah, partners, and perspectives. Yeah, I, I think so. And really to, uh, to not make it a one-way road, um, but to make it equitable and to make it unified. And when we share this with uh, these developing nations in particular, they're like going, oh man, finally, there's an alternative, right? So I, I, you know, I, th I, think that's a, I think that's a real big one. Um, and I think, you know, so uh, for the second one you asked about, uh, um, I would hope it would be something in the innovation uh, area and leveraging the innovation, the resources uh, of the private sector. I've had the good fortune to bring on uh, eight folks that I've worked with uh, before from the private sector, and it's a dream team. And I couple them with foreign service officers. And um, uh, I hope that really, yeah, get, really gets institutionalized because you know we're sharing our knowledge, we're sharing best practices, we're sharing our relationships. Um, so that when we're finished serving, it still remains. And by the way, it's great too, because it really brings uh, these, these people came in from the private sector up to speed really fast, and they just adore uh, the career officers here. So it's that, it's that combination that's, um, that the U.S. Can, can hope also to be a leader as we work with countries to all recover, as we all recover from what we're all facing, uh, I think, globally, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we got to take it one step at a time. 
we need to understand that it's not binary. Uh, it's going to be uh, transformative. It's going to change how we work, learn, and play. Um, but there's a great opportunity to make a better world out of this um, and uh, improve lives, not just for the American people, but for everybody uh, around the world. And that's really our objective. We're the United States. Uh, we lead. We lead from the front. And uh, we have a great opportunity to do that, Nadia. Thanks, Keith. We look forward to staying in touch and catching up as the initiatives unfold. And if um, the Hudson Institute can, can do uh, anything to help, help you and your team, let us know. And thank you, everyone, for uh, watching. Look forward to a future conversation. And uh, everyone, stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. And thank you for your patriotism as well and all your hard work. You've made some tremendous comp contributions and you're a legend here in the federal government. So thank you. Thanks. thanks. Okay. We're, we'll cut this off now. Okay. Um, so th thanks very much.